welcome everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day. Uh, my name is Maureen with UE Systems. Um, happy to to have you guys with us today. We've got a nice sized crowd. Um, we're looking forward to having James Kabasovic with Iridicio talking about job plans and job mapping. Um, so obviously a pretty popular topic. We got a lot of folks that signed up um, and no doubt you'll you'll walk away today with some actionable items that you can um, kind of put put to use straight away. So looking forward to having James with us. Uh, before we get started, just a couple um, kind of housekeeping things. Those of you that have been participating in these for the last couple of weeks uh, have heard this, but want to reiterate. And for those that are new, um, just want to make sure you guys know that you know in this crazy time. Um, at UE Systems and our friends at Iridisho, you know, we're all here to, to be a support um, and to, to help as best we can, um, even though we're not able to come to your facility and, and be face-to-face -face with you or, or be doing training um, like Iridisho would be doing, you know, lots of classes and in-person um, coaching and sessions like that. You know, we, we do want to be sure everybody knows that we're, we're here virtually. Um, if you have any needs with, you know, particular to UE Systems with our software or with your instrument or with applications you're having, you know, wanting to get started on, things like that, just just don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, think of us as your, you know, ultrasound personal trainer. Um, and we just want to, you know, be a resource and, and we're happy to set up, you know, Zoom meetings or go-to meetings um, and, and do screen shares and things like that if we're talking about software and things like that. So um, definitely keep that in mind and, and please don't hesitate to reach out. We're we're just as happy to have have you know folks to talk to and spend spend our days with. Uh, so so keep that in mind and, and take advantage. Um, on that note, um, hopefully a lot of you have seen uh, what the efforts that we're doing with Iridicio, um, kind of calling it Iridicio and Friends Support. So they've got an entire website. You can see it there, help.iridicio.com. Um, with resources, all these webinars we've been doing are all archived there, all the upcoming webinars, the registration links are there. They've got additional um, no-cost uh, project-based learning opportunities, video and e-learning, lots of templates. Um, so for those of you that were on like the asset criticality webinar we had a couple weeks ago, um, those those kinds of templates and things like that are, are there for you. So um, we're just trying to find ways that we can all be productive and proactive and find positive things we can be doing during this time um, where maybe you're you're working at home or maybe your plants is is not working or not up and running at the moment, whatever the case may be. Um, just just use that as another resource um, and, and we'll we'll all get through this together. Um, so a couple more things. We I am recording this. So just like I said, it'll be archived on our website, on our YouTube channel, on Iridicio's website. Um, so so definitely keep that in mind. And you know, if you have friends that you want to share the link out with or if you want me to specifically send you the link, um, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to do that. Otherwise Otherwise, you can, of course, navigate to it in those various uh, ways that I just mentioned. Um, we do welcome questions, so I'll be keeping an eye on those. Just type those in. I think James might also ha have some kind of as much audience participation as we can muster with everybody being spread out throughout the globe. But um, there's also the chat box, so you might hear him ask you to do some of that. But uh, definitely type those questions in to me in the questions box, and I'll get those asked to James as it, as it uh, makes sense. And then, of course, at the end, and any questions we don't get to, we'll be sure to get those over to James and the folks at Iridicio so they can follow up with you offline. Um, and, you know, I, I have to throw this out there, but again, just ignore any crazy barking or yelling or arguing. Um, you know, I got a full house here, so um, we'll, we'll try to keep that to a, to a minimum. There's, there's rewards that are being offered in the form of ice cream, so hopefully that helps. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn the screen over to James, and James will let you take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Maureen. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well and ex excited to learn about job mapping and developing job plans. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting time. I encourage you to ask questions as they come up. Uh, Maureen's going to kind of feed me questions as we go. So if she's seeing themes or some good questions come up, you know, I'll take those as we go through the webinar and also take some at the end as well. Um, as I mentioned, as Maureen mentioned, sorry, I may be asking you to put some information in the chat box as well as we pro progress through this. 
uh, just try and get a feel of where everyone's at, that type of thing. Um, so for those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to work with or speak with in the past, my name is James Kovacevic. I am a principal instructor with Iridicio. I've been with Iridicio almost two and a half years now. Um, prior to that, I held a wide range of roles within maintenance and reliability. I actually started out as an electrician on the plant floor, did that for a while, had an opportunity to become a maintenance planner. Then while I was doing that, you know, even though you're not supposed to, but take over the storeroom responsibility as well and get that kind of moving, moved into a plant manager or a maintenance manager role. And then I spent time with Diageo. Um, you guys may not be familiar with that name, but you probably recognize their brands, Crown Royal, Smirnoff, Captain Morgan, Guinness, Johnny Walker, to name a few. Um, I spent a lot of time with them traveling across North America, South America, Africa, and Europe, implementing maintenance and reliability best practices across their facilities. And then joined Iridicio. Um, aside from that, I'm going to do a shameless plug here and plug the Rooted in Reliability podcast. It comes out every Tuesday. You can find that on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and a bunch of other um, locations for podcasts. On a personal side, I got three kids, two crazy dogs. Um, thankfully, my wife was nice enough to take them on a drive to get them out of the house so we could do this with hopefully minimal interruptions. And with that, uh, we'll get started. But before we jump into the content, what I want you guys to do is take a moment and in the chat feature, I want you to put your one word for reliability. We're gonna circle back on this in a minute when we talk about job plans, but in the chat, go ahead and put your one word for reliability. What is reliability to you? All right, now, what is what does this picture represent to you? You know, when I look at something like this, a pit crew, you know, I get the feeling of speed, efficiency, precision, professionalism, those types of things. Now, I want you to ask yourself, is that how operations views your maintenance department and program while they're doing work? Do they see everyone out there on task, knowing what to do, organized, being efficient and effective with that downtime? You know, I have the experience of not always being that precise with our maintenance group. You know, we get the piece, we get the line or piece of equipment from the maintenance group for, or from the operations for a period of time to do maintenance. And what, what normally happens? Well, you get one mechanic working on this piece of equipment, another mechanic working on that piece of equipment, but really not being very efficient with our time. All right. That's one of the challenges we experience within maintenance and reliability is making sure we're efficient and effective with our time. The other thing you may notice when you look at this is you see a lot of safety going on here. Everyone's got their proper PPE, everything's marked out. And you know, in a lot of organizations, not only is efficiency a major, major important piece of that organization, so is safety. Now, how do we get this efficiency, this safety, all in one. How do we how do we get to that point? Well, in my experience, that reliability, that safety starts with a good plan. And it goes further when you have great job plans. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how do job plans contribute to both safety and reliability? Well, let's get let's dive into that and, and discuss how job plans help with safety. So some of you may have seen this graph. This comes from Ron Moore. Um, author of some great books, but what he did is he was able to get a lot of data and a lot of information. And what he was able to determine was that as we do more corrective work orders and reactive work orders, injury rates increase. Now, why do they increase? Well, generally, reactive and corrective work isn't planned to the level that reduces the risk of injury compared with proactive tasks. I want you to think about it, and if you want, go ahead, throw it in the chat for me. But what level of detail are your PM procedures or your standard rebuild instructions compared to your corrective or reactive work job plans or work orders? You know, normally when I walk into organizations and I take a look, PMs, rebuilds, you know, they're really well defined. They're really well planned. They're calling out safety concerns, potential safety risks. They're doing all those sorts of things. But if we look at re reactive work or emergency work and even some corrective work, they don't have that level of detail. Not only that, we're being rushed 
as we're doing reactive work, we're being rushed because production is waiting for that equipment. So we know that as we do more proactive work and less corrective and reactive work, we're going to have a safer work environment. The other hey, thing, so James, um, sorry, just going to pop in real quick. Um, I think so. A lot of the, the questions you're asking, people are putting their answers into the questions box and not the chat. So you're not. It's not that people are ignoring your requests. They are being chatty and, and offering answers. You're just not seeing them. So um, just to give you an idea for the reliability, what you know, word that it means to people. I was seeing a lot of. Um, safety, I was seeing a lot of consistency, teamwork, uh, dependability, um, and efficiency. So those seem to be kind of the main main words I was seeing. So I just thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you, Maureen. All right, continuing on as well. What we know is that as we increase our PM and PDM work orders, our injury rate decreases, you know, kind of inversely related to the other one. But what we know there is that we, as our PMs and PDM work is defined, we generally have very good job plans. They're calling out very specifically risks, hazards. How do we mitigate those risks and hazards? Potentially, what permits do we need? Referencing lockout tagout procedures. It's doing all those great things. So obviously, the more proactive we are, the safer we're going to be. So in order to be proactive, we got to be planning jobs. We got to be planning them to the right level of detail. All right. Now I asked about reliability. You know, what is reliability to you? Well, if, you know, I gave you guys gave some good one-word definitions here: consistency, quality, repeatability, teamwork, safety, all those great things. But if you look it up, these are the definitions: the quality of being trustworthy or performing occasional or consistently well. The degree to which a result of a measurement, calculation, or specification can be depended on to be accurate. Now, I really want you to think about that second definition there. From a PM perspective, or from a corrective or rebuild perspective, do your work orders and job plans allow your mechanics or electricians or technicians to take a measurement, take it repeatably and consistently so that if I have mechanic one go out and take this measurement now and I have mechanic two go out in five minutes and take that same measurement, are they gonna get the same results? That's what we need when we're looking from a PM perspective. We also need that same level of rigor when we get to corrective and rebuild procedures. But how do we do that if we don't have good job plans? It's really gonna be a struggle. Then we also have some other issues with reliability. Now, most of you recognize these, you know, the failure curves from the Nolan and Heap study, um, what's taught in RCM and a variety of other uh, learning activities. But what it essentially shows us is that most of our failures are not related to age. Most of them are, in fact, related to infant mortality. Now, what does this have to do with job plans? Well, we know those causes of infant mortality come from a variety of different places, design defects, manufacturing defects. Some of that's out of our control. We can't, we can't directly influence that when we're developing job plans. But those next ones we can, installation defects. How many of you have defined specifications for installing equipment? When you're aligning rotating equipment, are you checking for soft foot first? Then are you doing your alignment? Are you taking into account thermal growth? Oftentimes I see thermal growth is not thought of, and that's an installation defect, because now we're as that equipment heats up, it's gonna grow, it's gonna grow out of alignment tolerance, and we're gonna have premature failures. What about commissioning? Do we have a proper commissioning pr procedure built into our job plans, or a proper way to hand it over to operations or shut it down? You know, those types of things influence that as well. We have improper routine maintenance. Once again, those that consistency in terms of a, performing an activity or taking a measurement. Lubrication, for example. How consistent are we at applying the right level of lubrication there? Do we have the specifications? Do we know what we need to, what lube levels we need to apply? Or are we relying on and pump three shots of grease into that bearing? No, that's not very specific or consistent. And then we got workmanship. And I'm not saying that we don't have capable people. There's other pieces that come from workmanship and we're gonna talk about those next. 
we have human performance factors that influence us. All right, there's a lot of issues that potentially are going on that's going to cause some of those workmanship issues. All right, now a lot of this can be addressed with good job plans. But first, before we dive into that, I want to make sure we understand what these types of errors are. So the first one is really an unintended mistake. So what that really means is the slips here can be thought of actions not carrying out as intended or planned. A great example of that is you fat finger something. You meant to type nine, but you typed eight instead. All right, that's a slip. Job plans can help minimize some of those. Lapses, and I'm sure many of you've experienced some of these. How many of you have driven to work or driven home from work and not remembered that drive? That's because our mind works on autopilot sometimes and lapses are those exact things. We skip certain steps, we miss certain actions because our mind is on autopilot, right? Job plans and a checklist combined with that can eliminate lapses as well. Then we have an intended error or a mistake. Now that is a misapplication of a good rule or application of a bad rule. Once again, you know, that's something we can help mitigate and manage through various techniques, but having good job plans will help minimize those as well. And then lastly, we have violations. Violations, you know, someone knowingly and deliberately commits an error. Um, procedures and checklists, they're not going to help mi mitigate or minimize those violations. So those we really can't tackle. But by having good job plans, checklists, we can actually address those top three the slipses, the lapses, and the mistakes. Right. So what I want you to do is in the chat, how many of you are working to reduce some of these issues currently? Are any of you actually actively working to reduce slipses, lapses, mistakes um, by developing job plans, checklists, those sorts of things? Just go ahead so and throw that in. So feel free to just put those in the question and then James, I'll just kind of give you some feedback because I guess the chat, maybe that is not a public thing for everybody because people don't seem to see it. And it's hard for me to know as an organizer since I can see it, um, whether that's you know open to everybody. So anyway, um, I'm Perfect. seeing a lot of people saying they use checklists, that they're using their existing um, PM optimization projects, that they're working on it. Um, a couple people saying they're not working on it. So you're getting kind of across the board here. Okay, excellent. It's definitely an opportunity. If we go back to those, those failure curve, 68% infant mortality. You know, we're leaving a lot on the table. Procedures, job plans, that's one of the way to tackle those activities. You know, that, and how much does this give us? What's the benefit? So if we have a written procedure available, so I'm talking a good detailed step-by-step -step job plan like we're gonna learn about next. If we have that, we'll get about a 5% error rate, typically. Now, if we combine that with a paper checklist, we can get that down to about a 1% error rate. And then if you use digital checklists, you know, built into the system, that will not allow you to continue unless you do so. We can get that down even further. But even having a written procedure, having a 5% error rate, that is a dramatic reduction in infant mortality based off what I see personally in most organizations. Adding a paper checklist to that, hugely, hugely beneficial. Now, those of you who haven't already, um, The Checklist Manifesto, it is a great book. I highly encourage you to grab that and read it. It talks about human error, the role of checklists in eliminating human error, and a variety of great things around that. Um, it's actually changed some of the way I think about planning now. Um, it's definitely worth picking up and going through. So how do we actually develop these job plans? What can we do to develop good job plans that allow us consistency, repeatability in our work, allows us to capture knowledge, and all those great things? Well there's a way to do that and that's called job mapping. So the way job mapping works is we're going to break down not only projects but jobs into smaller and smaller buckets. So at the very beginning let's talk about a project. We might have a winter shutdown or a summer shutdown. We're going to do a bunch of maintenance work. Now within that project we're going to have a whole bunch of different jobs. All right. So in this example we have to replace the number two seal water pump. All right, simple enough, we got, a, we got a job, we're gonna replace the water pump. Now what we do from a job mapping perspective is we take that job and we break it down into larger tasks. All right. So as you see there, we have example of 1.B, remove old pump. 1.A, for example, may have been lockout tagout. 
1.c, install new pump, 1.d, commission new pump, and so on and so forth. We break that larger job into tasks. We're doing this so we can bucket our work and dive deeper into the individual steps needed to perform that task. From there, we're gonna go down to the steps, and each one of those tasks are gonna be broken down into four to seven steps. Now, if we start exceeding that seven steps, you know, we're at 10, 20, 30, we might need to look, that, look at that and breaking that up into a few more tasks as opposed to one larger task. But these are the very specific activities that we're gonna do. Set new pump. You know, if we're removing the old pump, it might be, you know, attach rigging, then lifting and so on and so forth. We're gonna get very, very prescriptive in what we're doing here. Then we have one more step down, which is the instructions. And these are specific to each step. And we'll dive, dive into these in a bit more in a minute. But as we break these down, we wanna make sure that, you know, we do a couple things. One, we start numbering and lettering the jobs, the tasks, the steps, so we can keep these in sequence. As we build these job maps, and I'm not suggesting you hand these out to your craftspeople, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but we wanna keep these organized for ourselves. We also wanna keep the descriptions very, very specific. One noun, one adjective, one verb, that type of thing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use sticky notes primarily, and we're gonna do this over the course of a whiteboard, a desk, something of that nature, and we're gonna break out these jobs as such. So one of the things we also have to be aware of is as we start to map these out, we have our steps here, brake coupling, rig to lift, pick up old pump, that sort of thing. There's certain things we need to be aware of, and we need to make sure that we communicate out to our maintenance technicians, especially from a safety standpoint. And those are warnings and cautions. Now I have to ask, I'm sure all of you are very, very diligent and you've always read the manual that comes with your power tools. And if you have, you would know the difference between a warning and caution. Now, what a warning and caution is, a warning is really related to personal injury. What can go wrong that can injure the user or someone around in that area? Whereas a caution, is more about damaging equipment. So when we're building this job map, we need to create awareness around both those warnings and cautions. So what this may look like is we might put a caution before the step. You see we're here, we're going to rig up, rig that equipment to lift. We're gonna put a caution in there. Next step contains rigging. Failure to follow all company standards and rigging procedures could result in equipment damage. All right. Now, next step is pick up that pump that's where we could have an injury. So before that, we're gonna map that warning. You know, the next step contains lifting, failure to follow those lifting procedures could result in severe personal injury. We wanna map the warnings and cautions before the step takes place. Reason we do that, we wanna create awareness of those before the person executes that step. That's why we map them before. We also color code them, cautions yellow, warnings red. Creates a visual reminder of, hey, there's a risk of injury here, or there's a risk of equipment damage. So we wanna call these out. And these are part of the instructions for each and every step. Next, we're gonna move on to constraints and resources. Now, constraints really is what, what, what is going to in, inhibit us from completing this step, right? Now, this can go a variety of different, uh, different ways. What's the weight of the pump? Where is the pump located? Do we have access issues? and so on and so forth. While resources are things that we need to do to overcome those constraints. So we always map constraints and impediments to the top of the step. Then we map resources to the bottom of the step. So what does this actually look like for us? Well, rake to lift is our step. A constraint is the weight of that pump. It's 2,500 pounds. I definitely can't pick that up, and I'm sure many of you can't either. So what are the resources we need to overcome this? Well, we might need some cables, some clevises. We may need our rigging standard or procedure so we know how we should properly rig this or what the requirements are for us as an organization. And then if we have to pick up this pump, what are the constraints? Well, it's 50 feet off the ground, and it's 75 feet from the closest parking spot. That's a major challenge for us to overcome. So how are we gonna do that? We need a 30 ton crane with 100 yards of stick and we have a lifting procedure again. So 
here, what we're doing is we're really identifying what are all the issues that we're going to have to overcome while we're doing this work, and what are we going to do to overcome those? This allows the planner to really develop or define the tools, the parts, the equipment, the stuff we need to perform those tasks and steps. Now from there, we get some other notes. All right, so here we got to swap that side, the side coupling hub. It's an interference fit. That's good to know. That's going to dictate what tools we may need to provide our technicians with to go do this job. So in this example, we might need a hub puller. We might need a torch. We might have reference some inspections procedures that we have. That way, everyone's doing it consistently. Now, we may also have some other information we need to pass along. And if we really need someone to take a measurement, make a judgment step, we want to highlight that in gray underneath the step. In this example, if those hub teeth are excessively worn, then we want them to replace it, and we are going to provide that part number. Now, I wouldn't suggest we go ahead and kit that part, but we're going to put it as a reference because they may need it. We also have performance standards that we need to, need to hit. Now, we talked about repeatability and taking measurement or consistency in the execution of work. Well, how do we get consistency if we don't have performance standards built into our job plans? All right. So that's something we definitely need to call out. So for this example, if we're going to install flange bolts, you see we got our resources there. We got a torque wrench, the socket size, that sort of thing. There's special instructions, so there's a special torque pattern that we need to follow, but then we also need our specifications there. All right. So that 85 foot-pounds. Now, I suggest we take specifications a little bit further using a 3T approach, and I'll talk about that in a moment. All right. But we need to call out the special instructions or specifications that we need to do to, to perform that task. Now, if we map all that out, this is what a job map may look like. We're going to have warnings, cautions, constraints and impediments, performance standards, notes, resources, and a variety of things. All right, This is going to get big, and this may get not so pretty. Here's an example of the larger activity for replacing that pump. All right, So this is what the maintenance planner is doing with sticky notes on a whiteboard or potentially a desk. Um, you don't have to make it look pretty like this on the screen. This is I created a nice pretty one here for an example. Usually this is sticky notes, you take a picture of it and you use that. This job mapping activity is really for the planner to organize and think, think through the job from beginning to end. It's really about making sure we don't leave any stones unturned. We identify all the critical things to make sure this job is successful, not just from a safety standpoint, but also from a reliability standpoint. Now, some of you may be looking at this and you may be thinking, you know what, that's a lot of detail. I don't know if I need that level of detail in my job plans. You know, I hire experienced people or I only hire journeymen. I don't need all that. Well, I challenge you to go ask three or four or five of your journeymen on how to perform a task if you don't have procedures like this already. And I'm willing to bet you're gonna get three or four different answers. They may be similar, but they're gonna be different. And when they're different from a preventative or predictive standpoint, can we trust our reading to be consistent? You're all well aware that from a predictive maintenance standpoint, we need our readings to be consistent and repeatable. If we don't have that consistent, repeatable readings, that data is a potential issue for us. We may not be able to trust it. So you need to get that level of detail to make sure we get that from a predictive or preventative standpoint. From a corrective standpoint, if we put this pump in and we went to start it up and it failed upon startup, if we don't have a good job plan like this, how do we go back and figure out where things went wrong? How do we know where the mistake was made or where the issue occurred? It's going to be very, very difficult because everyone does it differently. What we can use these for is as we develop more of these and get to this level of detail, we can start figuring out where the errors occur, where the issues occur, and put in checks. I was working with a client in Illinois, not to her November, October, November of last year, 
and what they'd had for certain parts of their job or certain jobs, they actually had what they what they called QC checks built into their job plans. So in this example here, after we align the shafts down there at one C4, they would actually have another step in their procedure right after that, which would be QC check. And if it was alignment, it meant they had to take a screenshot of the as found and as left readings of that alignment. So they could prove that they hit the specifications required. Now, if they couldn't take a screenshot or something like that, there were times where a lead hand or a maintenance supervisor would actually have to come over and verify that those specifications were hit. They were doing that because they knew there was opportunity for errors within these job plans and they experienced it over and over. So they built those checks in to make sure that those didn't hit the shop floor. That's how we, another way we improve reliability through job plans. Now, I know what you're thinking. Do I give this to our technicians on the floor? The answer is no. This is a tool for the planner to develop the job plans, but this is not what we're gonna hand out to the technicians on the floor. The planners have to use their technical writing expertise and their communication skills to assemble this into a job plan next. All right. But before we go there, I want to touch on one more thing here from a detail standpoint. All right. As I mentioned, many of you probably think that this is too much detail. Some of you are thinking this is the right level of detail. Now, one of the things you got to consider when you write job plans is that level of detail that's required. All right. Now, one of the ways to do that is, you know, what is the current skill level within your work group or within your team? If everyone's very, very experienced, and so on and so forth, then we might not have to put as much detail. But I caution you, if you're thinking that way, you're not always gonna have that experienced workforce. You're not always gonna have those very experienced mechanics. You may have apprentices coming in, junior people coming in. So we wanna write job plans, not just to the current level of, of experience, but also the future level of experience, right? That's important. As people retire and move on, if we're, writing them to this level, we're capturing their knowledge, they're helping us update these to the right level. So as new people come in, we don't have to relearn all this stuff the hard way either. All right. From there, once we have this, we're gonna convert that to the job plan. All right, now how we do that is with something called simplified technical English. All right, so simplified technical English is really a set of writing rules and it actually came out of aviation. Um, for those that are not that familiar with aviation, the international language of aviation is English, meaning every control tower around the globe should have some English speaking people to be able to communicate with aircraft. Most manuals are all provided in English as well. Well, some of the challenges with that is English isn't always everyone's first language, it might be their second or third. So simplified technical English is a way to communicate in a way that is understandable for everyone, even if English isn't their primary language. It also eliminates some issues with how we interpret things. All right. So writing procedures is not a simple task. All right. Many people have different opinions on the sequence, the specifications, etc. But we really need to rely on simplified technical English to help us. If we like to write novels when two sentences will work, that's going to cause issues from a reliability standpoint misinterpretation, miscommunication. Um, you know, we might be doing things ahead of where we should be. You know, think back to some of those psychological factors we discussed earlier. Good procedures help us eliminate some of those. So simplified, in, simplified technical English, it's a set of writing rules, how we're gonna write, and we'll cover those in a moment. There's a dictionary of controlled words, all right? Slang, specific words mean certain things, that type of thing. One word, one meaning, right? No, the idea behind this is to reduce that ambiguity, improve, improve clarity, comprehension, and consistency in the work. Now, I'm going to share with you an example of why this is actually helpful. I had the opportunity to work with uh, a client down in California. They had a seasonal workforce, so it was in agriculture, and they would have a lot of non-native English-speaking people come on site and do some of the maintenance work as well as the operations work at certain times of the year. 
Well, there was an activity that was being performed. It was a simple oil change, right? And within that procedure, you know, it said drain the oil, re, you know, replace the filter, fill oil, check for oil pressure, that type of stuff. Well, interestingly enough, when we got to the replace filter portion, what do you think they did? Do you think they took the old filter off and installed a new filter? That's what I would assume they did. But not being a native English speaker, English as a second or third language, to them meant replacement, you take the old one off and then you put the old one back on. It sounds silly, but it happens. So we need to be very specific in how we deal with writing procedures. Once again, you're gonna vary this based upon your organization but it is something we need to be aware of. So from a simplified technical English standpoint, we wanna be very specific and we wanna keep it simple. There's whole th courses and plugins and stuff you can get for this. I advocate keeping it simple. We wanna use very short sentences. I don't want any big run on sentences or anything like that. If we're writing a paragraph, less than six sentences. No slang or jargon. So I was working with a mining client down in the Southern US and they had a lot of bucket conveyors. And every person you asked had a different name for those buckets. I had buckets, diggers, dippers, bins, just to name some, name a few. Everyone had their own slang for that particular part. We had to standardize that to buckets, both in the CMMS as well as the procedure. So everyone knew exactly what was meant, right? We wanna be as specific as possible, you always want to use a or an and the where possible, all right, before a particular object. When you do sequential steps, you want to break them out separate lines. I often see people, what they'll do is they'll put a colon or semicolon and they'll do one, then two, then three, all in this big run on sentence. Break out sequential steps as separate sentences and lines, make it easy to follow. If you're going to do lists, put a dash in there bullet but break them out that way graphics are another one of those areas where they're over and underused I've seen organizations go to a completely visual work instruction it can be helpful at times but it can also be it can also hinder at times um, and I've seen others where they don't use any graphics there's got to be a balance there when graphics are required you know we when they can provide clarity maybe an exploded view, or if you have to take a measurement in a very specific spot, but there's no consistent way to ensure someone is through text, put a picture in for that, absolutely. But I wouldn't advocate having a complete visual work instruction, if you will. Warnings, cautions. Talked about those already, but we wanna call those out in bold letters before the step is occurring. All right, that's gonna draw attention to that, that potential risk and make sure that everyone is aware of what it is. Some other stuff, I mentioned the 3T methodology for identifying performance. And to me, this is a very simple way to make sure everyone's hitting consistent measurements and performance requirements. So the 3T methodology, the first is target. What is the target that they're expected to achieve as that for that work? So in this example, our target is 35 foot pounds. Then we're gonna provide that tolerance. So plus or minus 10% or plus 10% minus 0%, whatever that tolerance is, we wanna specify that out. And I like to go the one extra step of not just saying that plus or minus, but also give them the range that is acceptable in whatever value is that they're measuring. This eliminates that one other possible error or mistake that can come in from misplacing the decimal or converting units or whatever may take place. Then we have the test. And this is really verifying the as left condition. So in this example, what I may do, take a torque wrench, set it, see where, and figure out what the actual torque is on that value. If we're doing alignment, right, that target may change on shaft to shaft alignment, depending on what that rotating speed is. If it's 1800 or 3600 RPM, we're gonna have different tolerances. So we need to make sure it is specific to that particular application. And once again, we'll put those different tolerances in there and then we'll have them record as a way to validate that we are in fact inspect, inspect, sorry. Right. Now, as we pull all this together, now we can combine this into a good job plan. 
what that job plan looks like is something like this. Now, I know many of you are using SAP or Maximo or other systems, and you can't always set up the color coding. I get that. Um, if you can set up color coding within your CMS for warnings and cautions and performance specs in green, you know, do so. If you can't, just put a big, bold warning or caution or capitalize it all like you see in the example here, but do something to call out attention to it before that step takes place. Now here you can see as we break it down, replace pump, replace the pump component of the number two seal water pump. Once again, that's our job. That's that number one level. Then you see we got our task broken out. That's indented in one step, the 1A, 1B, 1C. Then we bring it in one more level to those steps. So disassemble the cup plane, remove the flange bolts, and so on and so forth. We're going to bring it all in there. Now, one of the major advantages to this approach, actually there's a few. One of first of first of them is we often get asked, how do we get good time estimates for our jobs? When you break jobs down to the individual steps just like this, it's very easy to come up with accurate time estimates. Instead of taking a swag at it, you know, by breaking it down step by step, you get a very good idea of what the time to take to do this job is. All right. The other major advantage to this approach where we take the time to build those job maps, then convert it to this job plan, is that even if it's a job we've never done or unfamiliar with, when we break it down in that logical way, we can think through most of the things that are going to come up. We can think through and identify what tools, what parts, what equipment we're going to need. And oftentimes, for, if it's a larger job, complex job, um, it may not be just the planner doing this. It may be the planner and two or three very experienced maintenance technicians that are building this job map together, and then the planner will convert it to the job plan. The whole goal here is to really make sure that we identify everything we need to do to eliminate some of the risk and some of the wastes from the maintenance process. So risk being the safety and reliability side of things. Um, from a waste side, the efficiency. How many times do we walk back and forth to the storeroom? How much time do our maintenance guys spend looking for materials or information or those types of things? When we build, break it down to this level, we can make a significant difference and reduce the amount of time it takes and ensure that job is done well. Now, in the question box, if you can go ahead and answer, how many of you have job plans that are written to this level? And if you do have some that are written to this level of detail, what percentage of your work actually sent out to the technicians in the field actually have that level of detail? All right, so <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of none, <laughs> not even close, 1%, we don't, nope, don't have it, trying, I got a, I got a 5%. All right. There you go. Um, 3%. Oh, someone is at 70%. So they're, that, that's good. That's very <laughs> um, good. Working on it, working on it. 30%. So um, I think I just saw an 80%. So sorry, 70%er. <laughs> now we got a new winner. <laughs> All right. But, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, you know, it takes a lot to get to this level. So how do we go ahead and make that change? How do we transition to that level of detail in our job plans? Now, I am not advocating you start planning every single job to that level at this point. I don't think it's gonna work. Um, I'm a big proponent of pick two jobs a week and plan them to that level of detail. That's it. Pick two, break them down to that level, get that level of information in there. The ones you pick I think are very important. If you only have time to do one a week or two a week, that's fine. Pick ones that you're, you're going to be able to leverage that success from. So I want to see PMs that we're doing on a weekly basis. Those ones are good candidates for this job mapping activity right off the bat. Complex rebuilds. When we rebuild something and we know it fails 10 or 20% of the time after we rebuild it, good candidate for this activity. Corrective jobs or rebuilds that we do quite often, once again, another good candidate. Or if you have a specific model of a pump spread all across your facility, work on that pump is probably a good idea because you develop it for one, you develop it for the rest of the facility. 
all right? That is the big thing here with these, is we wanna make sure that if we take the time to develop these job plans, write them, get, get them down to that level of, of detail, we wanna make sure that we're gonna get value for it. So pick ones that we're doing often, that result in a lot of downtime, that are complex and people confuse or mess up. We really wanna focus on those. Now I'm saying one or two a week as a good starting point. Obviously you're gonna hit that tipping point that as you have more of these in the system in your job plan library, you're gonna free up more and more time to develop more and more. But as a starting point, one or two a week is a good way to do it. Now the other challenge with some of this is when you traditionally haven't had good details in your job plans and you're sending them out to the maintenance guys for the first time. They've become accustomed to not getting good job plans. So do you think they're gonna take the time to read that work order? I'm guessing the answer is no. They're probably not gonna take the time to read that work order because they're used to getting these very vague, undescriptive job plans. So one of the ways you can actually overcome some of that and work to create awareness or attention, draw attention to it, is if you print your work orders, the ones that have a really good job plan like we just looked at, print them on pink or green or orange paper. Print them on something other than white. So it acts as a visual cue that, hey, this one is planned to the level of detail. Maybe I should read it, all right? That's one way. The other challenge we have with these is, even if we use the job mapping approach, the planner is not gonna develop a perfect job plan. I'm sorry, I have yet to see it. And if we're developing perfect job plans, we're spending too much time because perfection is the enemy of good and we're not gonna get anywhere if we're aiming for that perfection every time. So what we need to be doing is using feedback from our technicians. So once again, if we have that colored paper, people are reading those, you know, if people see something wrong, you got the wrong specs, you missed a step. Hey, if you do this this way, it's gonna save us 10 minutes because of this. We want that feedback and we wanna incorporate that into the job plan, all right? The key to that though is making sure that we actually use that feedback. Nothing's worse than asking for all this feedback and then all these job plan changes sitting on a planner's desk accumulating because after two or three times of seeing that same issue and reporting it, you're gonna lose that feedback and that is very hard to get back. One of the ways I've seen some organizations overcome some of this is if you know, you're not getting any feedback is you know, supervisor may be saying thank you, that's one way. More elaborate, I've seen where, you know, names are entered into a raffle for people who provide good feedback and once a month the gift card goes out or a pizza lunch or whatever. We can do stuff like that as well to get this feedback. The idea is to build these up over time on ex based on experience so that way everyone can do this job consistently and well over time. Right. With that being said, that's all I've had, but I have time for questions. So Maureen, if you want to fire up the questions um, while you're sorting through yeah. those, what I want to do is I want to make sure everyone is aware of, you know, Maureen mentioned of it, mentioned it earlier, is that we have help.irradio.supports. Um, we have a lot of activities up there. We got a lot of knowledge and uh, resources up there. But what I'm also want to offer to you guys as well is if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on the screen. I got a white paper on this topic. I'll be more than happy to, to provide to you. Just reach out and I will get that to you. It walks through this step-by-step -step detail. It gives you a little bit more information on some of the technical writing aspects. And you know, that is a big win for you guys to start using this moving forward. In addition, as part of that ERD show helps as well, if you wanna use this methodology and write one or two job plans, or you wanna submit a job plan, for some feedback and coaching, let us take a look at it, that type of thing. You can send it to me directly, contact information's on the screen, and I'll be more than happy to review that, provide you some feedback, or get on a call with you and walk through what I'm seeing, what opportunities I think there are. So that's there for you guys, reach out if you need it. Yeah, that's awesome, and I highly recommend folks take take advantage of that. This is not, um, you know, this is that's a really uh, generous offer, and, and um, I think everybody would get quite a lot out of um, having that um, unique ability to get get some no cost coaching from the the good folks over there at Iridicio. Um So James, okay, here we go. We got quite a few here, so we'll see what we can get through. And, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, if we don't get to all your questions, which we won't, um, we will get all of these over to James, and, and they will follow up with you. Um, offline. So we will we'll, we'll manage it that way. So here we go. 
How do you build a culture that appreciates, embraces, uses procedures and job plans versus considering, versus considering them as a crutch for the new guy, but unnecessary for experienced people? How do you build a culture that appreciates this um, so that, you know, they can actually make it happen, make it fly? Yeah, there, that is a large challenge. Um, one of the things that I like doing, and I think I mentioned it already, is, you know, take four or five of those people that are saying this is a crutch for the new guy or don't don't believe in this procedure, procedure-based maintenance, if you will, um, and have them describe how to do the job. Chances are they will start arguing with each other on what, what the right way to do this job is because they'll each have a different perspective. That usually triggers one of those light bulb moments where they recognize that, you know, maybe there is some opportunities here. The other way to do it is if you know we have infant mortality issues where something's failed prematurely for this or for that, highlight what the root cause analysis is telling us. Was this missed? How did we miss? How did that happen? That type of thing. Point to that. Some of the other ways is you got to create a connection. Now, if you're team is made up of veterans, particularly from the Navy or Air Force or mechanized army. Um, everything they did from a maintenance perspective is based on procedures because they have a steady turnover. They need to drive that reliability and operational availability. Mm -hmm. So you can relate it back to some of that as well. All right. Um, a couple people asking uh, kind of again for resources and I saw several people ask what the name of the book was you mentioned earlier. So maybe you can share that again. Yes. I, I know you love it and it is great. <laughs> yep, so the book that I mentioned is Checklist Manifesto. Um, I cannot remember the guy's name that wrote it for the life of me at the moment, um, but it's Checklist Manifesto. If you Google Checklist Manifesto or throw it in Amazon, it'll come up right away. It's not a long read but it talks about how checklists and human errors can be overcome by checklists in aviation, medical, construction, even finance and hiring. Um, it's a great, great resource. Yeah, and you know, if we're ever able to gather in groups again, um, James has an awesome workshop that I got to sit in on actually that was all based around the checklist manifesto. So, um, you know, hopefully conferences happen again here soon. <laughs> so I would just, tell you to keep an eye out and if you have the opportunity to sit down on that um i highly recommend it so a little free plug for you there um okay and then i think last question we'll get to and then we've got a couple of, um closing slides um several people kind of looking for where where should these job plans reside where should they live do you have recommendations for that yes so ideally it would be in your cmms uh, if you're using SAP, setting up your task list, for example, is one way to store these. Maximo has something similar you can use. Um, that's one way. The other way I've seen it done is it's done on a SharePoint or a network drive. Um, if you're going to do it that way, the big watch out to store it on there and then pull it into your CMMS, whichever it is, is the naming convention of them. you got to name them in a way that's easy to find, not just for that specific asset, but also assets that are similar. Whether it's the same make and model or a similar make or the same make but a different model, so a lot of procedure would be the same. We want to find make sure there's an easy to way search and leverage these job plans. So if you can't do it within your system like SAP or Maximo, um, SharePoint or a network drive is a good way to do it, but you gotta think about how you're gonna name and organize these so you can leverage them across the entire facility or sister facilities. Okay, awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna pull the screen back. Um, another question that, that came up a few times was about you know, whether we were recording this. So yes, this was being recorded and we'll get it up on our YouTube channel, our, you know, our website, your DC will have it up on their website, hopefully later today. Sometimes the system gives me glitches, but, but today, tomorrow morning at the latest. Uh, so if you specifically wanna know when to when that's available, you can send me an email um, and, and I'll, I'll send you the link directly. Otherwise, you can just kind of keep checking back and, and hopefully find it. Um, so, James, that was awesome. Um, he didn't mention, but um, or maybe he did and I missed it, but he, he hosts a Rooted in Reliability podcast. Um, so if you're looking again for more, more ways to, to educate yourself and stay entertained in these, these crazy times, I know they're 
they're what keep me company on my my walks. I love listening to podcasts. But James has a great um, podcast series um, and free plug for us today. His episode that launched was actually a conversation he had with Doug Wagen, who works for us here at UE Systems. So um, talking uh, ultrasound and remote monitoring and things like that. So you can check that out um, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, right, James? Spot, are you on Spotify and Apple and all that stuff, right? Yep, all of those. Uh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. So check that out and let us know what you think. Um, and if you've got ideas for you know future topics or you want to be one of the topics, um, I know James is always looking, so, so hit him up. Um, so upcoming webinars, because we want to keep these rolling and, and keep this um, content coming to you. So Friday, we're going to be talking about um, getting the most out of your Ultra Pro 15,000. So if it's an instrument you have and it's kind of sitting there collecting dust, which we hate, um, or if it's something you're been thinking about wanting to get, or if you just kind of even want to hear a little bit more about what ultrasound can do, um, all of that will be covered. So check that out on Friday. Um, and then next week, um, we're going to have two webinars. We're going to have Sean Eisenhower with Iridicio talking lemons to lemonade, a look at change management using the COVID-19 experience. Um, so pretty, pretty good topic. I'm trying to do a little bit more leadership. Um, how are you leading others during this time? How are you leading yourself? Some of us are um, working from home for the first time, which, which uh, has its unique challenges, um, or you're managing people who are working from home for the first time. So uh, those are just minor, minor things that, that'll get covered. But, um, you know, we, we've all experienced quite a bit of change here um, in these last, this last month. Um, and Sean's got some great content to share about um, some change management techniques. So Check that out next Thursday. We'll get an invite out on Monday, um, and we'll start having the links available on, on social media as well um, here soon. So check that out. And then on Friday next week, we are going to talk remote monitoring and permanent sensing with ultrasound. So again, those of you who are at, at home and your assets are obviously still at the plant, um, you know who's keeping an eye on them. So um, felt like that was a pretty pretty good topic for us to cover. Um, so hopefully you can join us for that. And again, all of these will be recorded. All of them will be available to view if you're not able to join us live. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and with that, I'll leave our contact info up there. So feel free if you want to, if you miss getting James's info, just hit me up. I can hook you up with him. Um, but, uh, you know, send me an email if you have any questions or if you guys need anything at all. Um, we're here and we'll all get through this. And we hope everybody stays healthy and we will catch you guys later.